Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. George Zarkadakis. He is a writer of fiction and non-fiction, a science communicator, an artificial intelligence engineer, a futurist, and a digital innovation professional. And today we're going to talk about his newest book, Cyber Republic, Reinventing Democracy in the, in the Age of Intelligent Machines. So, Dr. Zarkadakis, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Absolutely. A pleasure all mine, Ricardo. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So, I mean, let me perhaps first ask you, what is the premise of your book? So, I wanted to research a question which was given all the technological disruption that's coming online because of this new host of technologies such as artificial intelligence as well as blockchain internet of things but mostly around artificial intelligence and given the impact that we are witnessing in terms of our politics in terms of our economy is there a way that uh, engineers and thinkers in the west can rethink and repurpose those technologies. So instead of having those <clears throat> negative externalities and negative impact, can we turn this around? Can we make those technologies so that, remake rather those technologies so they can work in favor of having a more inclusive and a more democratic society? So that was really the, the question and the premise of that book. And uh, from then on, I started you know, looking into several new models, several new ideas, uh, trends, and, uh, and all this is summarized in the Cyber, cyber Republic. Mm -hmm. So I assume, I assume you think that the technologies brought about by the digital age did not deliver on, on their promises, or do you think they did, but we can do better with them? So, like in everything, yeah, there is nothing is all good and nothing is all bad there's a mixed mixed bag so when it comes to what we call the digital economy i think there was a huge positive impact in our society because of the digital economy essentially it um it um we, we managed to overcome the limitations of physical space with digital technologies Right. So you are now sitting in, uh, in another country and I sit in another country and yet we can have this conversation. Other people that watch us now from, I don't know, from all over the world can participate in this conversation at zero cost, almost zero cost, near zero cost. So I think this is great. So because of that sort of, you know, um, destruction of physical space, let's say, new marketplaces were created new marketplaces for ideas, for products, for goods. And now this, and this is exciting, right? Now digital economy is a, it's a big percentage of the, of the global economy and all the other businesses are trying to become digital businesses as well. So what we're thinking about the digital economy and the way the digital economy works now, uh, one can argue will be how almost everything will operate in the next decade or so, okay? So this has been very positive. But at the same time, we see that... Um, uh, because of the, what they call network effects in the digital economy, which I can explain a little bit more if you like, but essentially that's what makes successful businesses in the digital economy successful, is how many people are using it and how many people bring more people to use them and so on. So this is the network effect. Now, because of that network effect, it means that we have a lot of consolidation across all industries. This means very few players are dominant in, <clears throat> across industries. And that creates you know, the classic problems of oligopolies, which is lack of competition and therefore lack of innovation, uh, too much wealth concentration in the hands of the few, and therefore more inequality, and most importantly, loss of trust. So I think we are at an inflection point here when it comes to the digital economy. We can see that from all kinds of things that are happening, you know, the regulator backlash in the European Union similar, against the big tech, you know, similar things we see on the other side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> and something needs to change. So what needs to change was one of the questions I asked in my book. Right. 
Could you explain then how new technologies connect to politics and how we do politics? Because at a certain point in the book, I think you say something along these lines that new technologies force us to create new social contracts, right? So could you explain that? Okay. So in terms of the impact that, let's say, um, digital platforms and uh, algorithms have in our in our politics, it's multifold, right? So you have like well, one big sort of class of um, impact that's around misinformation and, and polarization, the so-called echo chambers, where uh, most of us re receive our news through, let's say, social media. The social media have algorithms in order to serve as content and those algorithms look at who we are, who we are connected with, and essentially the server's content that appeals to us. It doesn't necessarily challenge us. So that mm -hmm. creates a, a confirmation bias. Essentially, if you are a right-wing or you're, you're always receiving right-wing content, if you're left-wing, you're more, receiving more left-wing content, essentially what that means is like, you know, a society sort of polarizes more and more and people don't listen to each other anymore. And that is, I think, the biggest problem of all. Okay. And now it also impacts how elections are fought. So, um, you know, Cambridge Analytica scandal, for instance, you know, uh, is, a, is a typical example, meaning that, uh, you know, political forces in the liberal democracies are using uh, very advanced uh, methods for communicating messages where, in fact, they identify at a very granular level uh, voters that could swing the election one way or the other, and by targeting those voters with uh, specific uh, content, they create bias in their minds, essentially they brainwash them, and they win elections. Uh, so just, just a couple of examples when it comes to the, to the political process. But if you look at the politics in a, in a larger scale, and by that I mean how we govern our societies, how we are as citizens, then, uh, you know, there's a huge impact in economics as well in the economy, right? Politics and the economy, I would argue, are very closely linked. Uh, for instance, you know, are we, um, do we have a fairer society? Do we give more opportunities for people to rise in terms of social, of social status and economic status? I think we're not. And just to give you an example of how this impacts politics as well, um, because of digital platforms and because of the uh, potential of uh, digital platforms to be able to identify down to the individual level, I, who you are and what is your income and where you live and all that information. Now, we have this problem called uh, poverty premium, okay? So poverty premium means that poor people in our society, they pay more for the same services that richer people enjoy. Uh, a typical example is insurance. So insurance uh, companies, because they can use digital information, they can estimate risk at a very individual level. So if you're, a, let's say, a, a poorer person, someone who doesn't have much income, they have more risk, or you live in, an, in a neighborhood that is, you know, not very nice, okay? That means you have to pay more premium in order to insure yourself, right? Or you cannot be insured at all. So that's the poverty premium. So those are the so-called externalities, the fancy word meaning, you know, the negative impact of those technologies that ultimately create the big problem that we have. And the big problem that we have is loss of trust. Okay. So that's me trying to answer at least the first part of your question, Ricardo, right? Now to the second part of your question with regards to social contract. Um, I think this needs to be put into the context of uh, the so-called industrial revolution, right? Uh, historical idea of an industrial revolution. So if you look back, let's say, the 17th, 18th century, where the first industrial revolution happened, uh, where we had profound changes in society. For example, people left agriculture, moved into the cities, became laborers and workers. Uh, the idea of work changed. So people, you know, before the first industrial revolution, they didn't do work in the same sense that we do now, that they weren't paid, you know, per hour. Um, they were mostly, you know, farming, uh, with very few people doing work. But after the first industrial revolution, we have this concept of work where we have, we're paid for our time. So that meant a new, a new social contract, essentially, right? So every time we have a major technological disruption that upsets the economy, then that impacts society a lot and therefore we need to readjust 
how we understand our relationship between ourselves as citizens and the state, how we understand how we, you know, um, place ourselves vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the companies that provide work, et cetera, et cetera. So now, many people argue that we are in, a, in the fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. and we can discuss a little bit more what that means. So again, we have this sort of similar upheaval of everything, everything changes. I think in this particular case, what changes is again, how we perceive work, whether work is necessary, to what extent, and if it's not necessary, how do we replace work in our society so we can sustain uh, social and economic mobility? So that's a big question. I don't think we have an answer. I'm trying to give an answer in the book, but that's, that's the big question, I guess. So that will require a different social contract for the, what we have now. So what we have now, let's say, you know, simplifying is, you know, I work hard, I obey the laws, and I get a benefit, which is, you know, economic stability, and some kind of pension, and you know, for my old age, you know, I enjoy some security because of, you know, the justice system and the police. You know, this is the organized society that we live today, right? Within an, a nation state. Okay. Now, if we look into the future, will this model hold? Uh, I would say no, uh, but we can have this discussion. Uh, why I, that I say that? <laughs> Sure. So many things to explore there. Let's try to walk point by point. But starting with politics, uh, what would you say are perhaps some of the biggest issues that our modern democratic systems have to deal with? And perhaps later on, I will ask you how technology could help there. I think the big tipping point in our liberal democracies. So let me take a little bit further. Let me take you a little bit back, right? So, you know, in 1990, uh, there was a big moment in history where, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed, the Eastern Europe communist system collapsed, and uh, out of those debris, what the clear victor was the so-called uh, liberal democracies, essentially the political system that we have in most Western countries where you have parliaments, you have free elections, you have a free press, independent judiciary, and you have a a kind of free market economy, meaning, you know, actors are free to operate within a regulatory framework that is um, determined by parliaments, okay? That, that's a mixed kind of economy that we have. And that model seemed to have worked quite nicely. And um, people didn't worry about it too much. There was a little bit of inequality, but, you know, people got along. And then what happened was the big financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And I think that was a watershed uh, for uh, across the West, okay? Um, that created, I think, a, de a huge deficit of trust. That's what happened. And that's the key problem that we have right now in uh, Western democracies. We have a, a deficit of trust. People just don't trust the system anymore. Uh, that creates enormous instability in Western liberal democracies. Right now, if you look uh, at our planet geopolitically, it is the United States that is most, the most unstable country in the world. Uh, and this is these are where the in my opinion, the, the most geopolitical risk exists right now in, in America imploding in the next 10 years because of uh, strife and tension. We have huge problems in Europe as well. Um, uh, immigration is, is a big problem on both sides of the Atlantic and how societies are dealing with immigration. And these are huge, huge problems and citizens don't trust politicians to solve them. So we, we have a problem. Most definitely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, do you think that other forms of democracy that are not so common, like direct democracy, could help here? So the, the only time that direct democracy was tried on our planet was in ancient Greece, in ancient Athens, right, mm -hmm. where you had a purely direct democratic uh, political system. Okay, over a period of maybe, I don't know, 60 to 80 years, okay? It was an interesting experiment, and without going into much detail, um, it's changed over the years. Like, people sort of started with a very simplistic idea of uh, the demos, which, by the way, in Greek means the poor people, right? Doesn't mean everybody, but it means the, the rule of the poor people, okay? The riffraff, essentially. Uh, it wasn't a nice word before uh, Athens established it as something that created the civilization that it did, right? 
And after Athens, it became a bad word as well, by the way, right? So what we call liberal democracy, which is a, a design of the Enlightenment, uh, although it includes the word democracy in its title, essentially what it's trying to do is trying to limit democracy as much as possible, okay? But we can come to the subject in a moment, all right? So just to answer your question, there are huge problems with direct democracy. And the most obvious problem is that we are not rational beings, okay? We are emotional beings, and we usually act upon the spur of the moment. It's emotions that drive us, rather than the logic. The Athenians discovered that in a very bad way. They lost the Peloponnesian War, for example, to the Spartans, because they couldn't take the right decisions. They, were, they weren't cool-headed enough. And they tried to evolve their system by introducing a constitution, for instance, you know, a set of laws that could not be changed by themselves, right, by putting limits on, this, on themselves. Okay, so I think this is the idea of, of the liberal democracy. How can we create a system where everybody has equal rights, which are protected? Okay, and that's a huge, huge problem because if you think about, you know, a direct democracy where the majority always rules, the clear danger is the tyranny of the majority, right? So, so for example, you know, in a society where the majority are Christians, they may decide to exterminate those who are not, for example. You know, why? Because the, there's no reason why, because they're the majority, okay? So unless you are able to contain and reign on, on the tyranny of the majority, you don't have equal rights, okay? At the same time, when you have people who are all equal and have an equal voice, how can you create consensus in a society where everybody has different sort of ideas and different interests, right? Okay, so all these huge problems, I'm not gonna go into a huge lecture on political science right now, but people in the Enlightenment, uh, when this idea of equal rights essentially um, came about, a very radical idea, by the way, uh, wasn't something, it, it was something that took a long time to, to come to fruition. They tried to think through constitutional laws, designs, whereby you had a system of government that balanced the will of the people with checks so that the will of the people was not, which was definitely not right all the time, would be contained for the, for the good of the people, okay? Mm -hmm. And this whole design rests upon trust, okay? So people need to trust the institutions, people need to trust the representatives for the system to work. If people don't trust, the institutions, then this system doesn't work at all. And I think that's where we are today. We are at that crisis point where people don't trust their institutions. For example, you know, m many people in, in Europe and, and in the United States think of, our, you know, parliamentarians or congressmen do not serve the interest of the, of the people, but they serve the interest of, you know, big corporations, the, the interest of their families, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And, and, and I think that is why we need to definitely re-examine this political system called liberal democracy. And the way I'm suggesting that we do it in my book is by introducing as much direct democracy as possible into the system. Not to go all the way to direct democracy because I just explained I don't think this is a good idea. In fact, I think it's a very bad idea. But include as much as possible common citizens in the discussions and decisions around, around policies. And, uh, and we have examples of how to do that, and many countries are already experimenting with ideas such as citizen assemblies, an idea that I'm explaining in the book as well. And the reason why we need to do that, I'm gonna pose in a moment, is because the way things are now, citizens are essentially, you know, backseat drivers. You know, we are like the audience in the theater of politics. We sit in a dark room and, and on stage, the politics take place, okay? Uh, we can complain, we can throw things at the, at, the, at the stage, but we're not up there, right? And our psychology is one of, of, of an audience psychology, right? We need to accept more responsibility as citizens as well, okay? And to accept more responsibility means that we have to be more responsible in practical terms, not just go every four years and vote for somebody, but have more active role into the actual policy making. So, so anyway, that's a long way of saying, you know, we're in trouble, we can't keep on doing business as usual, we have to think of ways that we can evolve a political system. Okay, so with all of that in mind, could you explain then how can we use new and emergent technologies to 
increase or improve direct democracy for people to be to participate more in in politics basically and perhaps to weigh the and improve political decisions? So I think there needs to be a, we need to think this, pro this problem more broadly. So technology, I think is useful and can play a role um, to provide some spot solutions, but it's, it's mostly about institutional design rather than um, just, uh, you know, coming up with some smart uh, applications, okay? Mm -hmm. So in my book, I'm sort of, you know, thinking about the importance of cities, for example right, as uh, an important political entity where we can start embedding more direct democracy at the city level, okay? And it makes sense because uh, cities are hubs of innovation. They are places that have a lot of problems, but there are some very good solutions as well. Uh, people, as you know, as we are, we feel stronger for things that matter to us more directly than things that matter to us more indirectly. So you can start, you know, f with your family, extend to your neighborhood, your city, and then your region, your country, and then the planet, right? So the more far away you are from the family, from your family, and from your media background, the less engaged you are, I would argue, okay? And I think I'm true because the data show this as well. So we, we should start from somewhere where people actually feel not only strong enough, but for practical reasons, they have they can have an actual impact. Okay, so the direct impact yeah, you can have in your in your neighborhood and in your city, you can't have it at the national level or the international level or the climate level. Okay, where everything becomes very theoretical. Uh, so if we start from cities, and now I'm going to bring a little bit of technology in. You know, there's this concept of smart cities, for instance, right? So what we want to do is we want to um, add layers of technology in our cities that provides us with more information and more uh, possibility to communicate, understand the way we live, but also participate in decision making. Okay. Potentially could provide us with ways to govern the cities in a completely different way, in a more decentralized way, but also capture some of the economic value that cities create. Okay. And let me explain this a little bit more. So, in this scenario whereby technology is embedded into the city, let's say, for example, we have sensors, we have networks, we have dashboards, we as citizens are connected into networks within the city. There's a lot of data that is produced by, by those interactions, right? In today's world, data are siloed and are usually owned in one way or the other by minorities, okay? Uh, mostly the big tech companies who make the most of them, they train the algorithms and make trillions and trillions of dollars, right? But we can rethink that. We can rethink, for example, a smart city whereby we have decentralized uh, computer networks. Um, this is where blockchain can play a very important role and a lot of innovation that takes place right now in the so-called Web 3.0, where you know thousands of very smart engineers are, are thinking of ways of completely changing the distribution of value uh, and make it more diffusive, right? So for instance, you know, the data that a smart city collects, which essentially are data coming from interactions between citizens, can be, um, can be put into what is called a data trust, essentially a legal construct that manages uh, that data and has so-called fiduciary responsibility towards the citizens, i.e. is trying to make the most of that data for the benefit of the citizens. And then once you start thinking that way, then this data trust can make that data available to innovators that want to use that data and develop new applications, right? So suddenly you have a, a new social contract, for lack of better words, where the value that citizens create through that interaction doesn't get extracted from the system in order to make only a very few people rich. Instead, it diffuses the value more in terms of going back into the citizens, either as direct monetary value perhaps, or, you know, because uh, the city will have more capital to improve the lives of citizens, make be better lightning, better transport, better schools, and all the rest, all right, okay? But at the same time, very importantly, it creates more opportunities for innovation, okay? Because right now, the problem with innovation is everybody's talking about innovation, doing uh, great innovation. I would say that we're not innovating enough, quite frankly. And the reason why we're not innovating enough is because if you're a startup with a great idea, 
you want to use AI, for example, to do something interesting, you need data in order to do that. And data is not around. You can't find enough data in order to scale up. And what usually happens is you don't, and you either die or you get acquired by the big ones. And instead, and instead of having you know, more teams creating a more varied environment and a more vibrant economy and more competition, we have consolidation, again, what I said before about network effects, into those very, very few big, huge, enormous companies. Okay? And that's what we need to change. We absolutely need to change that. Okay? And there, this is a way we can do it. Right. So I would like to ask you also about what do you think about the future of the job market if you think technological unemployment is a problem we have to care about and to deal with in the more or less immediate future, let's say? Or, I mean, what are your thoughts about it? Okay, so, so this is a very interesting question. Uh, Ricardo, because there's a lot of books been written, a lot of thought is going into the so-called future of work, right? Is there going to be work in the future? And I think if we, you know, be very futuristic and consider of the possibilities that intelligence systems can afford this, if you look into a future, let's say, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, it's easy to imagine a time when, you know, the machines will do everything right? Mm -hmm. Almost everything. And there's not going to be any work to go around. And that's not a bad thing, because we can, we will be living in, a, in an economy of abundance, essentially, right, where the cost of goods will be extremely low, and therefore we can have a complete different idea of, of life, okay? Uh, work is a way of, um, of realizing yourself, right? It's something that creates value for human life, and I think that's a good part of work. Uh, the negative part of, of work is when most people do shitty jobs, right? That they don't like and they hate them, okay? So, you know, long term, we can think of a future perhaps where we do interesting things because uh, how we monetize our time and what we do with our time are separated, okay? Because right now they need to be connected, okay? So we can think of a future where we do things that we want, for example, and we don't care about uh, pay because there's not going to be any, any meaning in payment. We can do whatever we like. But we're not there yet, and I, I don't know if we're gonna, ever going to get there. So let's go back and a little bit in, forward in the next 10 years. Let's see what's going to happen. So we clearly see trends here, okay? So we can make much better predictions. Let's say what's going to happen in the world of work in the next 10 years. And essentially, you know, the pandemic helped us, not helped us, I don't know if the right word, but certainly accelerated those trends, okay? And th those trends clearly mean the, the loss of full-time employment, essentially, right? Full-time employment will be, become a rarity, okay? It's already becoming a rarity, right? Something that is rare, okay? It will become more and more rare. Why? Because companies are structured, their purpose is to increase profitability, okay? And we can debate if this is right and wrong, but that's a different debate. But right now, the purpose of businesses is to increase their profits, Okay, and you can argue, you know, they increase the profits, therefore they're taxed, and therefore, you know, if they have big profits, that means a lot of tax going back to the country. Okay, let's leave that conversation for now. But to increase profits means to increase efficiencies, to be able to do the same thing with less, or in fact, to be doing more with less, even better. Okay, and the labor cost in most businesses is the highest cost of all. Okay, if you really want to become a more efficient company, you have to reduce your labor cost. That's the easiest thing you do, okay? And now, companies have more and more means to reduce that labor cost, either through automation, but most importantly, through sourcing labor from other geographical uh, places where the cost is lower, and also source labor, <coughs> excuse me, on a need-to basis, on a demand basis. So, for example, you know, I have a project right now, I need four experts to do it in the next six months. I don't need to hire those experts, use them for six months, and then try to find something for them to do the other six months, okay? So a lot of the full-time jobs are becoming part-time jobs or, or contract jobs, and that's gonna be the future of work, all right? Now, that means there's not gonna be job security, essentially. And that means, for example, young people and older people will not be able to plan their lives the way you know our parents and grandparents did. For example, you know, get a mortgage, 
buy a house, I don't know, whatever people want to do, right? Okay, if, you know, most people w want a stable life, let's assume, right? And that, w that is what's going to create uh, more social tension than, than exists already, okay? And that's going to be the problem. So um, I'm not the only one who's thinking about that, obviously. There's a lot of thinking going into this. How can we um, re-examine the social contract right now, which, as we discussed before, is I get a job, I work, I pay my taxes, da, da, da. but if there's no work or there's no stable work, I mean, where's the contract, right? The contract's gone out of the window. So one idea, for instance, is um, the role of the state needs to change. Okay, so there's a lot of thinking from uh, definitely one part of the political spectrum, I would say most of the political spectrum, about uh, the role of the state and how the state will become like an insurer for society, right? I.e. extending the welfare system to become like an insurance system. For instance, if you're not like, uh, you know, like... Um, like in Denmark, for example, right? So if you uh, if you have a job and then you lose the job, right? And then you, it takes maybe a couple of years to find another job. Then those two years, the state will pay your salary, right? Uh, we, we might train you, and then you can get another job and so on and so forth. So that's what they call flexicurity. Flexicurity. Okay. So these are some ideas coming from from increasing the role of the state. In my book, you know, I examined some other ways of doing it as well through those new technologies, through, uh, you know, imagining sort of cooperatives running in what is called Web 3.0. Um, how can we distribute um, value from the data more equitably and, and essentially, you know, trying to find a solution where the state, the role of the state does not increase because there are political ramifications in increasing the role of the state. Essentially what you're doing is, in my opinion, is you're creating more mistrust than you already have. Arguably, the mistrust that citizens have today is against the state, that the state has been captured by, you know, by forces, by oligarchs uh, who are using the governments and the state and all the funding for their own purposes to create more monopolies, right? So by increasing that state, I think you will simply create even more of a problem that we already have. But anyways, that is my, my opinion right now, okay? But that's the dialogue, okay? But Whatever camp you're on, you know, whether you're in my sort of bottoms up camp or you're the other sort of top down camp, I think the problem we're all trying to figure out is, is how we make the world a place where people still have a chance of living interesting lives and, and, and keep having social mobility and opportunity for people to have families, you know, to live in prosperity and, and realize their dreams. Mm -hmm. In terms of wealth redistribution, do you think what do you think about a potential solution like universal basic income? So that's so. So I think we will need, as I said, some way of evening out of those those troughs in income because if, you know you have a job, then you don't have a job, then you become poor, and then what happens? You know what happens to your mortgage? What happens to your loans? You know, there's a there's a chain reaction, right, in everything. Okay, and usually what you end up doing doing is you end up in a poverty trap where you, it's very difficult for you to come out again. So clearly the problem is there. Somehow we need to even this out, okay? <laughs> UBI is one idea, but I think the, the problem that I have with UBI is again, that it increases the role of the state. It makes the state all powerful. Why? Because everybody now is depending on the state, okay? Now, if the state is democratic, and transparent and citizens have access to how the state is working and you know we have checks and balances that are fortified and not the ones we have today right then maybe this will work okay but it needs to to happen like that okay it needs to happen like that there needs to be a, a power rebalancing when the state as far as the state is concerned if we are going to become even more dependent on the state. Because if it doesn't, then essentially what we're going to have, we're going to have an oligarchy, we're going to have an authoritarian regime, ultimately, dressed up as democracy, okay? Dressed up as democracy. Uh, the big temptation with, with power, and we've seen that clearly across history, you know, everywhere, and we still are, is once a political force comes into power in liberal democracies, try to hold onto that power, okay? And um, the more 
opaque the state is, the better chances this uh, power has of establishing itself as the dominant power. Okay, why? Because it can hire more people. You know, um, my country of origin is Greece, and it's a typical example of a of a country without strong institutions, where the politicians essentially use the state in order to bankrupt the country. And that's exactly what happened with the Greek crisis in 2010. Okay, the governments will borrow money on behalf of the people. They will take this money and will give it to their voters, so they would vote for them. <laughs> and that was a virtuous, you know, vicious cycle that ended up with bankrupting the country. Okay, and, and that happened because there weren't enough institutions to stop that from happening. All right. So that's why I'm worrying about UBI. I'm worrying about UBI because it will create enormous instabilities in uh, democratic countries where the institutions are not transparent enough and there's not enough trust in societies. Maybe it works for a few countries in. In Scandinavia, I don't know, maybe, but I have strong doubt that it was going to work anywhere else in any in any good way. Okay, and that's why I'm wondering. Okay, what alternatives do we have? And that's why in my book I'm looking into these concepts around what I mentioned before: smart cities, data trusts. You know, leveraging the possibilities that we have in this new economy of data. How we can we create institutions and structures uh, where citizens are not just consumers, but are essentially shareholders, active shareholders of the new wealth that has been created. Okay, so, so I think that's probably the best way of moving forward in a society that is truly democratic. Okay, uh, we need people not to have a, the right to vote, we need people to have, to be able to see long term, right, to be able to plan 10 years from now. Okay, if people can't plan because they don't have money, then uh, you don't have democracy, right? You have, you know, like Venezuela, okay? You have, you know, nothing. You have, you know, dictatorships, essentially, right? So I think those are the big questions, okay? Those are the big, big questions that we have today, that we need mm -hmm. to find some way to doing it, of, of finding a way out of that. Mm -hmm. Since you worry about an increased role of the state, at least in certain more corrupt, less trustful countries, let's say, do you think that AI could make a centralized planned economy feasible? <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's think of this question, right? Let, let me provide a little bit of background to some of your readers who may not be aware that, you know, we talk about the Soviet Union, right? And I don't know how we talk about the Soviet Union now, probably talk about the Soviet Union as, as a system of fools, that you know had no idea what they were doing and you know ultimately collapsed because of human stupidity the reality is that they were thinking of themselves as smarter than us okay and they were thinking that they had a way of making the system successful in a mathematical way actually right solving what is so called the socialist calculation problem which is a set of linear equations in fact that were you know put forward by a very famous economist of market socialism called um, 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 Oscar Lang, right? So in their minds, <laughs> they, could, they could solve the economy in a mathematical fashion, okay? Now, a Soviet mathematician called Kantorovich, Leonid, actually solved the problem, Ricardo, right? In fact, the guy won a Nobel Prize too, okay? He solved the problem, but the but he would only be able to solve that problem when it was too late. So the solution to the social calculation problem, which was essential for the success of communism, had to come at a time where central planners could look at the results and which would predict, you know, demand and supply and discover prices so they can set production levels, right? If it didn't come in time, if it came after the effect, they were of no use, right? So at that time, of course, they didn't have the power of computing that we have today, okay? So there were some folks that said, okay, it didn't happen then because they didn't have powerful computers, but if we take those equations now and we put them into a, a computer and we crank it up, then maybe we solve this problem early enough for central economy to work. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Why? Because, for instance, when Kantorovich was solving the equations, there were about, I think, 12 million uh, products in the Soviet Union, right? 
And now we're talking about billions and billions of products. So we have an explosion of parameters. Okay, so it's a problem, although theoretically feasible to solve, practically is impossible to solve. Why? Because no matter how computing power is rising, it will never catch up the number of parameters that it needs to calculate. Okay, so the parameters move like that and the technology moves like that and they'll never catch, right? So practically impossible. Now, in comes AI. AI is a different way of doing business. Uh, you don't have to uh, calculate hard. You don't have to run you know, multiple calculations like in nonlinear or linear equations, which are very sort of uh, computing, uh, you love computing. You can churn out data and, and run predictions. And that's interesting because if you look at who is the biggest communist country today, you'll, you'll see it's China, right? And China, although nominally communist, it's totally different than the Soviet Union, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, very high level and, and very quickly, you know, the recipe that China is using to become successful, having learned the lessons of the past, is a combination of a centrally planned economy at the, at the, uh, the CCP level, at the, at the Chinese Communist Party level, and free market economy when it comes to how businesses are allowed to operate inside the economy. So they're using a hybrid model, a very successful hybrid model, clearly. Okay. Now they are fully aware of the problem that this um, uh, model has, right? And the problem is that as more and more companies become more and more successful, you have those problems of inequality, you have those problems of asking for more freedom, da, 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 all, all the rest. So then they need a way to be able to control society and therefore the economy through prediction. And I believe the reason why China uh, launched the so-called social credit system whereby they use data to understand how citizens behave, how citizens understand uh, what's going on around them, how ha they have limited information that flows into China because they have the sort of, you know, uh, uh, the new Chinese wall, so you, you don't have access to, so let's say, to Twitter and other stuff, is to be able to, on one hand, release economic forces that create prosperity, at the same time limiting the information that enters China, or at least controlling the information that enters China, and thirdly, a third pillar, I would say, be able to, to look into data, understand and predict what's going on in the Chinese society and preempt the implications of, um, let's say, discontent. Uh, the latest example, for, for instance, that happened only a few months ago mm -hmm. is that the, Chinese, uh, the Communist Chinese Party changed its policy around big companies. We saw that, you know, with, um, uh, with you know, with Alibaba, you know, with the companies, how it, it sort of, you know, took the power out of the big sort of uh, the rich people in China immediately and how it sort of completely changed the tune. Why? Because it realized that they had to do something so that, you know, more Chinese people had a chance of social mobility. So that's an example of how China is working. So long way of answering your question. The answer is yes, it is and he's, you know, the technology AI is very instrumental in the Chinese government um, thriving, surviving and thriving in the 21st century and preserving the political system, clearly. I think the big problem with AI is that in the West, we, we are quite apprehensive what to do with this. We don't know what to do with it. China knows very well what to do with AI, clearly, right? And is doing it and very successfully. Okay, I don't worry about the Chinese, to be honest. I think they're, they're going to be fine. I think it is in the West that we don't know what to do with AI. So what we're trying to do is, you know, if you look at Europe, we're trying to sort of regulate it. Okay, we're trying to, con to, to limit it. We're trying to confine it. Okay, in the name of uh, privacy rights, et cetera, et cetera. All good stuff, right? But by limiting it, essentially what we're doing is we're stifling innovation in Europe. We're creating barriers for new uh, companies to know what they do, right? So you increase the risk of being liable to regulation costs and therefore no investment is going to go there. So all the bright guys will leave uh, Europe and go somewhere, somewhere else to do, uh, to do their companies, right? That's the result of the European Commission's, uh, you know, enlightened uh, rule of Europe, okay? In the States, you have the opposite where, you know, the Congress is resisting all kinds of regulation and the end result is, you know, as I said, there's oligopolies, 
and concentration of power in the big tech. So in both sides of the Atlantic, you have a big problem when it comes to AI, okay? And I think we need to solve AI very quickly in the West, because if we don't, uh, then we're simply gonna propagate the problems that we have, which is gonna be amplified and you know this, we're gonna implode. And at the same time, you know, our main competitor, and I say that in a nice word, not in a hawkish sort of military uh, way, our comp but we need competition on this planet. Absolutely. So the Chinese are, are, are moving far ahead in many, many areas of technology as we speak. Okay. Why? Because they have a very clear vision and a clear idea that suits and fits the political model and they are executing on it. On the contrary, in the West, I think we are confused, confused and torn apart. And that's why I'm, I started, you know, our, our discussion by making the point that Geopolitically speaking, the West right now is the most unstable, um, you know, geographical area on the planet. Mm -hmm. So, could you give us an overall view of what of how your cyber republic would work and uh, how it would look like? Okay, so, so the the idea that I'm so in the in the book, I'm I'm not proposing like, you know, an accurate model and say, you know, like, uh, you know, philosophers of the past would say, okay, like, you know, this is the utopia we have to live and that's what's made. It's not like, uh, you know, the, the capital is it's like nothing like that, right? It's, uh, it's a very sort of, it's in, the, it's in the same sort of spirit that as engineers, we, we build systems, right? We start with something that is very conceptual and open to discussion and open to innovation, and we tweak it as we move along. We test it and we tweak it and see how it adapts, right? So it's a very adaptable model, the one I'm proposing. But it has certain principles, right? Okay, and it's the principles I think that are very important. Principle number one is that we need to involve citizens in, uh, in the governance of, of whatever it is that we govern, whether it's private companies, whether it's institutions, whether it's uh, cities, whether everything. You know, we need to involve us in the governance, right? <laughs> Without, of course, you know, going all the way to the tyranny of the majority. I'm not suggesting that, but we need to be involved. Okay, that's number one, the principle number one. Principle number two is that citizens need to partake in the economic value that is created, directly um, enjoy the economic value that is created. So indirectly, we can say that we are enjoying it through the taxation system. Essentially, means that we have the state, which is uh, redistributing wealth, right? It takes taxes, it redistributes wealth, and but there's a huge problem with the state, as I explained before, uh, and there's a problem of trust. Okay. Uh, there's other problems as well, but I'll just stick with the ideological too. But I'm not going to get into ideology. I would just, you know, reference a fact that no one can doubt regardless of where you stand politically, right? So we have a problem of trust. And so instead of making that problem of trust greater by giving greater authority to, to states to dis redistribute wealth, instead of going down that route, which is clearly failures, maybe we should think other routes whereby, you know, we have, you know, popular capitalism, essentially, right? Where we are, you know, receiving income, okay? Our wealth increases because we are, participating in a multitude of new digital platforms that are creating innovative new products, okay? So, so we can do that, all right? So that is the second principle. Um, and these are the only two principles that I, <laughs> that I have in mind, okay? And based on those two principles, I'm suggesting some tools, some methods, some approaches to make those things real, okay? Like, uh, you know, in terms of Citizen participation in governance, I'm proposing citizen assemblies or citizen juries, which are sort of random samples of citizens who come together in order to decide and propose uh, and recommend policies. Uh, for this to happen, clearly their voice needs to be heard. Okay, so there can't be, you know, we need to institutionalize something like that. And some countries are doing it. Like, you know, France, for instance, you know, is taking it seriously, uh, Canada and other countries as well. So. It's not the only idea around, but this is one of the ideas I'm suggesting, okay? Uh, I think, which is true to my principle. To the second principle, how can we, um, 
how can we partake in this sort of popular capitalism of the digital economy of the 21st century? I'm, I'm proposing ideas such as uh, data trusts that I explained before a little bit, and those so-called web 3.0 uh, digital platforms, which the easiest way to think of them is like cooperatives, okay? Like think, for example, an Uber, whereby uh, it belongs to the drivers, okay? So there isn't a, you know, an executive team, there isn't any shareholders, Every, it's, a, it's a cooperative. You know, and everybody knows what's a cooperative. Now, cooperatives have always been with us and some have been very successful, but the new technologies give us new tools to create cooperatives at scale that can distribute uh, value uh, quicker through, uh, you know, things like token, through cryptocurrencies. And I think this is a huge opportunity to take this model of, of cooperatives to the next level. Okay, especially because the key to the digital economy are network effects. Okay, I mentioned before, network effects is about, you know, users interacting. Okay, so the engine that powers success in the digital economy is us. Okay, we are the engine. It's not uh, a machine. It's not uh, an energy source. It's not a mine or a physical asset. It's us, our minds and our interaction. So we are the engine. We are the wind. We are the steam, right? So that is a unique um, idea that for the first time in human history has come into, into play. So we need to capture that. We need to seize that and understand how we can use that in order to completely rethink you know, business and business organization in the sense of that. So, so regardless, those are sort of some ideas that I'm suggesting in the book in order to to be true to my principles, right? And I invite others who agree with the principles to start improvising, testing, and, and, and coming together to, to try out new ideas in order to achieve those goals. Okay, so let me just ask you one last question about technology, specifically AI, because there are people who worry about us potentially losing control in the future when AI reaches a human-like level, right? Or, for example, if potentially it develops some sort of sentience or something like that. I mean, are those questions that you also worry about and that perhaps could play a role in the kinds of topics that you explore in the book or not? Most certainly. Um, let me say, first of all, that AI does not need to reach sentience in order to become uh, an existential risk for, for humankind. It doesn't need to reach sentience. In my opinion, it will never do, but that's a, a different story. But in any case, it doesn't need to be sentient. Mm -hmm. There is a problem with the very nature of artificial intelligence, the nature of the technology, and the problem is autonomy. Okay? It's the idea of autonomy. Autonomy is different from automation. And let me explain that, okay, so we don't confuse those two terms. Automation is when a system, a machine, follows a set um, series of steps in order to execute a process, right? So you don't need people to, you know, pick up something and put it there and screw it, you know, have a machine that does that, right? Step by step by step by step. But automation does not require free thinking. It doesn't require uh, decision making. It's just following steps, that's automation. Autonomy means that the agent, whether it's a human or a non-human, needs to take their own decisions about how to deal with a set problem, even new problems, all right? So that's the autonomy. And animals are autonomous, and we as an animal is also, are also autonomous. And one would argue that we are more autonomous than other animals because our minds give us uh, more choices for decision-making, all right? And that's how we can perhaps correlate intelligence and autonomy. Right, as two as two quantities that can that have a strong correlation. Now, why is autonomy a problem? Why AI is so linked with autonomy? That has to do with the central dogma of AI, an idea that came into fruition about 60 years ago, uh, in a conference at Dartmouth in New Hampshire, in, in in the United States, where a bunch of guys came together and they stipulated what artificial intelligence should be, and in their manifesto they spoke about system autonomy. Essentially, they wanted to build a system that doesn't need humans. It can act on its own, right? And interestingly, the motivation for, for stipulating that was uh, the Cold War, right? They thought that, you know, if we have a system that doesn't need people in order to function, then we have clearly a, a military advantage over the Soviet Union, right? Because the Soviet Union can bomb us, 
can destroy our military bases, but we're going to have artificial intelligence to re retaliate and win the war. Simple equation. Now, they did for that reason, but that idea kind of like, you know, became the central dogma of AI. And if you look now, you know, if you look at any AI system and AI research, what they want to do is they want to create systems that do it all by themselves, essentially uh, emulating human, human beings and, you know, trying to do things better than humans. Now, this is a problem. There are some use cases where you need autonomy, clearly, and you've got to have autonomy. Right? Like, for example, think of, a, think of space exploration where, you know, a spacecraft needs to go to a distant planet. Because of distance, we can't have telemetry, and therefore the spaceship needs to uh, have autonomy in order to take its own decisions. Okay? And we can think about the use cases as well. But if you start taking AI systems and embedding them in human society, in human decision-making systems, like, say, for example, embedding them in government or embedding them in business, so in government, the system will decide whether you should, uh, are, you know, you should get welfare or not. Uh, you bet in, 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 in businesses and the system will decide whether you're going to be hired or not on its own, then you have a problem. All right. So to cut a very long story short, Ricardo, in my book, I, I am suggesting that we should rethink AI autonomy. And the way we should rethink AI autonomy is by reintroducing humans in the loop. Now, the the framework to think that new AI is a framework uh, which is also 60 years old. It's called cybernetics. Interestingly, AI is an offspring of cybernetics. So cybernetics, for, for listeners who don't know, it was the, uh, the intellectual framework that came out of the Second World War where we tried to build engineering systems that kind of like emulated systems in nature where you have feedback loops. So a system in nature, because of feedback loops, it, it optimizes around its survival and therefore, you know, it's able to evolve, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that means that there is interaction between parts of the system, right? So if you think of human societies as a system, there are various parts in human society, but clearly one of the most important parts is the humans themselves, okay? So right now, AI sits outside human society, okay? It uses our data in order to increase its autonomy, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem. So re, reintegrating AI systems into his, human society will mean we design systems where the AI system is part of some feedback loop where humans are in control. At least humans say, if we don't do that, then we will have you know, more inequality and, and ultimately we may indeed have an existential, an existential risk. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Zarkadakis, let's end on that note. The book is again Cyber Republic, Reinventing Democracy in the Age of Intelligent Machines. Uh, where can people find your work on the internet? Uh, to one of the big uh, tech uh, monsters that I mentioned before, named Amazon. Uh, I think that's the easiest place to buy it. Uh, of course, you know, it's, it's available in other bookstores as well, but I would say Amazon is the best bet. Okay, so Dr. Zarkadakis, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Absolute pleasure all mine, Ricardo. Thank you for having me. Thank you. To you. Absolute pleasure all mine, Ricardo. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perurga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Ernst Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, 
Craig Hill, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adan Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Taffini, Akeon Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.